Hello, everybody, and welcome to Friday Apocryphal Podcast, your one-stop shop for everything Friday Apocryphal and podcast. And boy, do we have a show for you today. Today, we are covering 1 Maccabees chapters 14 through 16. Oh, that's pretty good. Almost a little bit asynchrony, but you're pretty good. Yes. Mm, we hope everyone is enjoying their quarantine. So yeah. happy, happy quarantine. Happy <laughs> quarantine. You can play the dreidel while you're quarantined with all of your family members. And, and you can all watch the show because we're still doing this. And yeah, we're Hopefully still doing we this. we still can. Yeah. Seems like yep. it's not a problem. I At least for now. I yeah. don't think it's a problem. But so we are finishing First Maccabees. We're going to be done with it. It's going to be all over and done, and we're never coming back to it. But we wait, are technically coming back to it. We're coming back to it immediately <laughs> afterwards <laughs> with Second Maccabees. It just retells the same story. I feel like we're going into Chronicles again. Yeah, it is. It is very similar to that. So I have a lot of reading to do for Second Maccabees, but we have a lot of good stuff on Second Maccabees. And most of it is from the same author. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we Ro- do have Robert quite. Doran or Duran. I don't know. Yes. We d- we do have quite a bit. And right now, we're going to be reading about First Maccabees. Yes, we will be. Of which I have the Anchor Bible version, a new translation with introduction and commentary by Jonathan A. Goldstein. We also have Erdman's commentary on the Bible and we have from the New Interpreter's Bible, we have the New Interpreter's Bible Commentary, Volume uh, 6. Yes, yeah, that, Volume that's six. 6. That's a 6. Yeah. You know, I complained to you before about them still using Roman numerals when yeah. it's redundant. Well, they, they, they look kind of neat. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, Volume 6. Yep. And when we move into Second Maccabees, we're going to be using... Uh, Hermenia commentary yeah, uh, as well, because there's also Second Maccabees commentary in there. Yeah, but the thing is, it's all from the same author. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to get to understand this author's perspective on yes, it we will. very well. Yeah. Um, okay, well, why don't I hop into it, unless you have something that you want to say about Chapter 14 right off the bat. Uh, I guess uh, a couple things. So, uh, Trypho had sought Roman support, but the Romans, while accepting his gifts, had them inscribed with the name of Antiochus VI, whom Trypho had murdered. Uh, And then, also, uh, Demetrius' actions uh, was more likely an attempt to push back the Parthian forces that had invaded Seleucid territory. According to cuneiform tablets, uh, Mithridates I ruled in Babylon and Seleucia on the Tigris in July 141 and in Uruk by October 141. So uh, just to give some some context there. All right. Um, There's a bunch that uh, Goldstein says. I'm sure he does. Introductory note to this chapter. I'm sure. Just looking over it, it's like... 10 pages long. (laughs) Um, And I'm not going to read all of it because essentially it's um, kissing ass and giving uh, support for how cool someone is. You know, that happens uh, quite a lot in the book, too. Yeah. I can't believe you guys are doing that. Good job. You're so cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's but uh, I, uh, I think it may be appropriate because the section uh, he calls Simon's Glory. Mm, Simon's Glory, okay. So we're going to hear about the glory of Simon here. In the year 172, King Demetrius assembled his forces and marched into Media, intending to gain reinforcements for his war against Tryphon. Uh, apparently this is the correct year, according to the note. However, on hearing that Demetrius had invaded his territory, Arsaix, king of Persia, and Media... Yeah, that's Mithridates, the the first that I was talking about. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Sent one of his commanders with orders to capture Demetrius alive. 
The commander, March, defeated Demetrius' army, captured him, and brought him to Arsax, who held him under guard. So, uh, on a little note about the year. Yeah, so it says that the year is uh, 172. That is, and uh, at least according to Erdman's, uh, that, that's the autumn of uh, 141 BCE. Mm-hmm. Um, Arsakes is reported to have left the scene of the campaign in Babylonia and gone far eastward to Hyrcania, around the southeast order of the Caspian Sea, surely to deal with pressing problems. The defense of Media and Babylonia he left to his army commanders. After winning several victories, Demetrius was captured and exhibited as an object lesson to the people under Parthian rule, who had supported him. We hear that the Parthian king was still in Hyrcana when Demetrius was brought to him. Thereafter, Arsix treated his royal captive with honor, giving him his own daughter in marriage. Uh, And it gives a whole bunch of sources. Yeah, good old royal marriages. But now there's a separate section here. It goes into like a poem or a prayer or a hymn or a psalm or something. (laughs) The land had peace as long as Simon lived. Yeah, this is a hymn of praise, and uh, it has a lot of allusions to Hebrew scripture. I mean, oh. we, we've already had so many of them so, uh, in in First Maccabees. Right, because uh, as the commentaries pointed out, they were seemingly purposely trying to fulfill prophecies of Zechariah. Yeah, the, I mean, there were the prophecies of Zechariah. There were <coughs> also... They were trying to, you know, justify their own rules uh, or their own, you know, heroes. So they picked heroes that, you know, the the greater Jewish audience would uh, would recognize as heroes. Yeah. Which was actually a very common way of, uh, like, propaganda pieces in the Greco-Roman world. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, you get to the, even the Jesus stuff. Uh, it's very similar. Some of his miracles are really close well he does things that like serve the goal of giving things to poor people right well there's that people who can't feed themselves and shit like that there right? there, there there is that but it's it's more like uh like stilling the water for example or stilling sorry mm-hmm. stilling the storm um like that is a motif that is used throughout greco-roman literature uh to portray that you know god is with this person so there's even a myth about uh, Caesar stilling a storm as well. Uh, and I, I cover, uh, you know, these kinds of motifs. Yes. And one time I and yelled at the sky, knock it off, and it, and it got better. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, I cover those kinds of motifs in my video, uh, Jesus' Miracles. But, yeah, it's a very common uh, way of writing propaganda. It's also super common in St. Oh, right. Actually, most saints have some sort of water miracle as well as a floating miracle. If they're if they didn't have a medical miracle, that's sure. what they did. But I don't know if that's for the, for the same reason. I'm not sure, but they are. Uh, it's in the same category, I think. Well, re- read a little bit more of the saints, and then you tell us. Mm. He sought the good of his people. They welcomed his rule and by, and his glory as long as he lived. Uh, so, like Judas in 750 and Jonathan in 957, Simon provides rest to the land, just as the judges had. Uh, and it quotes some places in Judges. Uh, whereas those in the citadel had sought evil against the people, Simon seeks the good of the, of the nation. So, like I said, allusions to Hebrew scripture. Mm-hmm. There's a note here about this section. Uh, Knowing Simon's sad end, our author remains cautious insofar as he refrains from explicit claims that Simon's achievements were fulfillments of prophecy. Nevertheless, the abundant echoes of prophecies in the poem here are intended to suggest to the Jewish reader that the age of fulfillment of the prophecies of Israel's glory had begun in the years of Simon's rule. Uh, Okay. By means of all his glory, he captured Joppa to be a port and secured access to the islands of the sea. He 
proceeded to extend the territory of his nation after conquering the land. He collected large numbers of prisoners of war. In conquering, conquering Gazara and Bethzor and the Acre, he eliminated the unclean things from the Acre, and there was none to oppose him. So uh, the phrase to crown all his honors, he took Joppa uh, for a harbor, literally with all his glory, should be understood from the context as referring to Simon's troops with all his glory. Uh, uh, also promises of enlarged territory in response to Torah obedience in verse 6. You got to verse 6 already, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, are found in Exodus and Deuteronomy as well. Isn't it common for Robans to promise land after a campaign of war with the troops? They're like, yeah, you also get some suck to the land we conquer. I have no well, idea. The... I- a lot of soldiers got farmland. Yeah. Right. Mm. Well, it depends at which period no, you're mean, talking about. Right? I, the majority of the pro- of the progressive Roman eras, mm. not the fall of Rome and such. Yeah. No, they got farmland, which was good deal, by the way. You know, you serve for a couple years. You know, maybe ten years, maybe twenty years. That determines the size of your lot. Yeah. It's kind of neat. Then you get this whole place that you, you can set up a vineyard you can make you wine could, you can do a lot of you stuff do a lot yours. of stuff yeah yeah but promises of land from glory and war very common yep and then there's simon who had all these prisoners of war the people farmed their land in peace and the land gave forth its produce and the trees of the fields their fruit the old people sat in town squares all chatting about their blessings while the young men put on the glorious raiment of war. So there is uh, there is quite a bit here uh, that we should note. We're not going to check all the, the other verses individually, but uh, these verses echo other descriptions of peace in the Old Testament. The elderly can sit in the streets reminiscing. Uh, and that's also, you know, as you noted, uh, in Zechariah. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see, what else? The... People are free to farm their land without fear of enemy attack or looting and without having to pay oppressive taxes to outsiders. And the land's productivity flourishes. And of course, there are references to Leviticus, Zechariah, and Ezekiel. All right. Tell me when you get to the end of 15. I will tell you when I get to the end of 15. Okay. Simon supplied the towns with food and equipped them with weapons for defense so that his glorious renown reached the end of the earth. He established peace in the land, and Israel rejoiced exceedingly. Everyone sat under his own vine and fig tree, with none to make him afraid. No longer was there anyone on earth waging war against them. The kings had been defeated in those days. In those days. In those days. N- probably not. It's, it's a different thing completely. Yeah, different. Totally different. <laughs> Simon supported all the, pe- the poor of his people. He sought to fulfill the Torah and wiped out all the impious and wicked. He glorified the temple and added to its furnishings that's the end of 15 i'd like to say that the olive tree and the vine are both uh symbology for peace as well they go perfectly in that and i know that a lot of people use uh, the the olive tree for israel right yeah. mm. Ex- extending an olive branch is an expression well, there's that, yeah. as well and there's a whole bunch of other things the cultures have you know diverted away from that but started with this kind of symbology right here Yes. The mourning and lamentations, such as followed uh, Antiochus the Fourth's sacking of Jerusalem in uh, chapter one, where the elders groaned and the young men became faint, are reversed. Uh, just as Judas's renown went to the ends of the earth, so too does Simon's, as his actions of defense are provisioning. Uh, 
Yeah, and uh, provisioning are recalled. Uh, just as Solomon brought safety to the land, so too does Simon. As the prophets Micah and Zechariah had foreseen, people sit under their own vines and fig trees. Uh, Simon is the perfect picture of a just ruler, as envisioned by Psalm 72.4, which we have covered, and Isaiah 11.3-4. through 4. Simon's destruction of the ungodly, again, mirrors Judas. So, yeah, lots of uh, Old Testament allusions there. Yes. And uh, before we hop into this next section, uh, let's talk a little bit about the uh, authenticity of some of this stuff. Okay. The, like, the little prayer here for him? Well, for uh, verses uh, 16 through 19, I should say. Okay. The authenticity of what we're going to be talking about. Yeah. Okay. So the authenticity, chronology, and meaning of the events uh, in these verses pose great difficulty. The author's uh, Judeocentrism is evident in his claim that Rome and Sparta were deeply grieved at Jonathan's death. Like, yeah, okay. Uh, It is unlikely, however, that the Romans would take the initiative to write a client state such as Judea without the formality of an embassy. The text of a letter from the Romans is not given, although they are said to have renewed their alliance with Judea. Mm. So that's uh, we're going to get into it a little bit more, uh, but you can go ahead and start. You can tell me when you get to the end of 24. Okay. Well, there's also a lot in here about this section. So um, I'm going to get to the end of 24, and then I'm going to hop into that. Okay. The news of Jonathan's death spread to Rome and even as far as Sparta. The Spartans were deeply grieved, but when they heard that his brother Simon had become high priest in his place and had won control of the land and of the cities within it, they wrote to him on bronze tablets seeking to renew with him the relationship of friendship and alliance which they had established with Judas and Jonathan his brothers. The inscribed tablets were read at Jerusalem in the presence of the assembly. The following is a copy of the letter sent by the Spartans, the magistrates and city of the Spartans, to their brothers, the high priest uh, Simon, and the elders and the priests, and the rest of the people of the Jews, greeting the ambassadors whom you sent to our people gave us report on your present glory and prestige, and we were delighted that they came. We have recorded the contents of their speeches in the proceedings of the people as follows. Numenius, son of Antiochus, and Antipater, son of Jason, ambassadors of the Jews, came before us with the intention of renewing their ties of friendship with us. The people resolved to receive the men with honor and to place a copy of their speeches in the volumes of the people's archives in order that the people might have a record. The people of the Spartans sent a copy of the foregoing to the high priest Simon. Thereafter, Simon sent Numenius to Rome with a large gold shield weighing a thousand minus in order to confirm the alliance with the Romans. When Numenius and his staff returned from Rome, they bore a letter to the kings and the countries, which read as follows, Lucius Consul of the Romans to King Ptolemy, greeting ambassadors of our friends and allies, the Jews, commissioned by the high priest Simon and by the people of the Jews, came to us to renew their long standing relations of friendship and alliance. They brought a gold shield of 1,000 minus 
Accordingly, we resolved to write to you, the kings and countries, to refrain from attempting to harm them and from making war upon them, their towns and their territory, and from acting in alliance with those at war with them. We have decided to accept the shield from them. Now, if any traitors have escaped from their territory to yours, deliver them up to the high priest Simon for him to punish in accordance with their law. He wrote the same letter to King Demetrius and to Attalus and to Ariarathes and to Arsakes and to all the following countries to Sampsame and the Spartans, to Delos and to Mindos and to Sicyon and to Caria and to Samos and to Pamphylia and to Lycia and to Helicarnassus and <laughs> to Rhodes and to Phasilus and to Kos and to side and to Arados and to Gortina and to Nidos and Cyprus and Cyrene, they wrote a copy of the letter for the high priest Simon. All right. That was uh, the end of 24. And what I want to say about verse 24 there, after the Spartans um, tablet that they sent, yeah. That's all verse 24. And, in fact, uh, Goldstein divides this into 24A, and it actually, <laughs> I've never seen this in, um, in the actual thing in the Bible. Or any oh, that is weird, things. yeah. It's and weird. Uh, it's a 24, that's smaller than a normal 24. Justin, and, thank you for the $2, by the way. Thank you, Justin McClure. Sorry that you can't be here for the whole thing, but yeah. thank you very much. Uh, yeah, it's 24A through... I mean, scholars divide it that way all the time, 24 but it's usually K. not a Through 24K, okay. Amazing. Why would this be written this way? I don't... He un- probably has a commentary okay, on it, but so it probably... He- I don't know if it uh, matters that much. I did have some some notes here for for the section that we just read. Uh, And it's actually quite a bit. So, kind of going off of uh, what I said before, it seems more likely that Simon did follow in the steps of Judas and Jonathan in seeking an alliance with Rome. The letter of, uh, and we'll get to this uh, in chapter 15, is probably the result of of that embassy. Uh, Demetrius has already recognized Simon as high priest in an earlier letter written sometime in 142 BCE. That was in chapter 13. Uh, Simon would not have had time to send an embassy to Rome after Jonathan's death, probably in the winter of 143 or 142 BCE, when no sailing could take place, and receive a reply before Demetrius wrote that letter preserved in uh, chapter 13. Perhaps Demetrius only needed to know that Simon had sent ambassadors to Rome. Um, And like I said, not done. There is still more. Mm -hmm. Uh, So specifically on uh, verses uh, 20 through 23, uh, the word rulers is actually, uh, let me try to read this in the Greek, uh, archontes. Uh, It's a very generic title and does not suggest uh, which specific officials are in view. Uh, and then verses 22 through 23 seem to indicate that this letter was in response to an embassy sent by Simon. Uh, furthermore, uh, this actually goes along with the commentary. I'm going to read half of this section, and then once we get to the next chapter, hopefully, Ruben, you'll remember to, uh, to read the next section of this. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's 24J, not I. Okay. Uh, so these passages, the ones we just read, uh, separated by the official decree in Simon's honor and the advent of Antiochus the seventh. And actually I should uh, preface this here. So 
this section is about diplomacy with Rome and Sparta. How many Antiochuses have there been mentioned? Uh, I mean, in this book? In the narratives we've we've covered, yeah. I guess this book so far is the only one. I mean, this one is like and, uh, four now? Four? Three I, or four? Three or four. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. Um. So either way. uh, So the first one that we just read is f- uh, 14, 16 through 24. And then the second one uh, is about... Uh, 15, 15 through 24. So uh, these are both discussed in this section. So it is a little weird, but bear with me. Uh, these passages separated by the official decree in Simon's honor and the advent of Antiochus the seventh, belong together in content and continue the theme of 12, 1 through 23. They help to disentangle the threads of Rome and Sparta. Thus, in 14, 16 through 24, the correspondence with Sparta is clearly distinct from the surrounding verses, and the phrase, quote, and as far away as Sparta was inserted into verse 16 when verses 20 through 23 were incorporated here. Uh, so this Sparta bit, um, the text and chronology of the letter of the Spartans here presents difficulties. Mm-hmm. Spartans could address a letter to Simon as high priest only when they knew Jonathan was dead. But in the text of the letter, there's no suggestion that Simon himself sent an embassy. Despite verse 18, it's hard to see the letter of the Spartans as anything but a reply to the letter and embassy sent by Jonathan. Thus, the ambassadors are the same as Jonathan's, and their message is identical with his. It may well be that no official embassy but only a private Jewish traveler brought the news to Sparta and that Jonathan's ambassadors were still there and asked the Spartans to address their letter now to Simon. Jonathan was killed well before the Feast of Dedication because the Jews' good reasons for haste in seeking the aid of friendly powers, the news could hardly have reached the Jewish ambassadors at Sparta as late as October 142, the earliest possible date for Demetrius's letter recognizing Simon as high priest. Yet the letter of the Spartans addresses Simon as high priest. There are several possibilities. The Spartans may have been the ones who jumped to the conclusion that Simon was the high priest, or great priest here might be used in the more general sense of distinguished priest, or a member of a high priestly family. Um, The more general use of the term could easily have reflected the status of Simon as acting high priest. It is also possible that Simon and his adherents before October 142 already viewed Seleucid rule over the Jews as illegitimate, and that Simon had taken the title high priest. If so, the step would have been viewed as invalid by Jews who believed that God's will still subjected them to foreign rule. Those Jews could have come to accept Simon as high priest only when he was confirmed by Demetrius II. Uh, Not merely Simon's adherents, but the bulk of the nation passed the decree that we are going to read shortly. Um... Uh, So I do have a couple more things here. Um, Or, okay, so this section I'm going to leave for you, but a different section that I am going to read is on this letter. Uh, This letter is hardly any more authentic than uh, than that in 12, 5 through 18, to which it is linked by the naming of the envoys in 1522. Um... The author is clearly much concerned to associate the Maccabean state with Spartans as well as Romans, perhaps because of their reputation for their laws and their military skills. The author's concern to treat the Romans and the Spartans together has left clear traces in the narrative, uh, both in 12, 1 through 23 and in 14, 16 through 24 and 15, 15 through 24, and is partly responsible for the confusions noted above. Uh, and those confusions we will get to, uh, and hopefully once we get to that letter, uh, you're remembered to hop back into that. <laughs> I'll remind you if you don't. Yeah. When you're going over the yeah. commentary, yeah. Well, they don't 
he doesn't really say that much about that. Great. But, well, um, let me continue. continue. When the people learned of these achievements, they said, how shall we show gratitude to Simon and to his sons? He arose with his brothers and his family and fought off the enemies of Israel, and they gained freedom for our people. They drew up a document on bronze tablets and sent it up on stone slabs to Mount Zion. So uh, the word used for people here, uh, demos, reflects official inscriptional usage. Uh, Throughout the decree, the usual term for people, laos, is used. The following is a copy of the document. On the 18th of Elul, in the year 172, which is the year 3 under Simon, high priest and prince of God's people, at a great assembly of priests and people and chiefs of the nation and the elders of the land, the following was brought to our attention. So uh, the 18th day of the month Elul, year 172, i.e. the 13th of September 141 or 140 BC, counting from spring 132 BC or spring one, or sorry, uh, spring 312 BC or spring 311 BC. Of course, we were talking about the different calendars that were used in their counting. So, mm-hmm. Whereas, at a time when our land was repeatedly afflicted by wars, Simon, son of Mattathias of the clan of Jorib, and his brothers exposed themselves to danger and resisted their nation's foes in order that their sanctuary might survive and the Torah... They won great glory for their nation. Jonathan rallied his nation and became their high priest and then passed away. Thereupon their enemies desired to invade their country in order to destroy it and violate their sanctuary. Then Simon arose and fought for his nation and spent large sums of his own money providing arms for the men of the army of his nation and paying their salaries. Hey, uh, just a quick question here. Did you come across uh, the phrase in Asamorel? Or did I miss that? Have you said it? In Asamorel? Yeah. No, I, I didn't see anything like that. Hmm. That is What's that it is supposed strange. to be? So um, apparently the translators of the... New Interpreter's Bible version uh, did not translate it for the following reason. Uh, why the translator did not actually, um, they're talking about the translator of the, the, the Greek text, mm-hmm. like from the Hebrew to the Greek. Um, why the translator did not translate Saramel or Asaramel is unknown. The text has been interpreted both as a place name, the count of the people of God, reflecting uh, Hebrew Hasaramel, or as a title for Simon, Prince of the People of God, Saramel. Uh, both have difficulties. The place name is not usually given after the date in such documents. One does not know how the preposition in could be placed before a title. So that's strange that he translates that at some point maybe. Unless I totally missed it. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then there's a a little bit uh, more on that. The phrase in a Saramel is unintelligible, but is perhaps a corruption of the transliterated Hebrew title, Prince of the People of God. Uh, In 1428, the personal reference, quote, was proclaimed to us. uh, uh, This is a, a different note, by the way, not about a Samarel. Uh, so in 1428, the personal reference was proclaimed to us, read strangely in a document otherwise cast in the third person. The original document probably began simply with the date. Mm. Okay. Um, he fortified the towns <coughs> of Judea, including Bethzur on the border of Judea. 
where previously there had been an enemy arsenal stationing there a garrison of Jews. He also fortified Joppa by the sea and Gazara on the border of Azotus, uh, previously inhabited by our enemies, settling Jews there. Whatever was needed for removing impediments to pious Jews... Uh, um, pious Jews' life in those towns he provided, observing Simon's fidelity and what he had accomplished and the glory which he proposed to bring upon his nation, the people appointed him their chief and high priest because of all of these achievements of his and because of his righteousness and his uninterrupted fidelity to his nation, as he sought in every way to exalt his people. Thereafter, during his time of leadership, he succeeded in expelling the Gentiles from his people's land and in expelling the inhabitants of the city of David in Jerusalem, who had built themselves a citadel from which they used to go out and commit acts of defilement in the vicinity of the sanctuary and gravely impair its purity. Simon stationed in the citadel Jewish soldiers and fortified it for the sake of the safety of our country and our city. He built higher walls around Jerusalem, Moreover, King Demetrius, in view of all this, has confirmed him as high priest and admitted him to the ranks of his friends and conferred great distinction upon him. Indeed, he heard that the Romans had given the Jews the titles friends and allies and brothers and that they had treated Simon's ambassadors with honor. Therefore, be it resolved by the Jews and the priests that Simon be chief and high priest in perpetuity until a true prophet shall arise and that he be commander over them and that he have charge of the sanctuary so as to appoint on his own authority the officials responsible for services for the countryside, for armaments, and for fortifications, and that he have charge of the sanctuary and all that and that all persons obey him, and that all contracts in our country be drawn up in his name, and that he wear purple robes and gold ornaments, no one of the people of the priests shall have the power to annul any of these provisions, or to oppose any of his future commands, or to convoke a meeting in our country without his permission, or wear purple robes, or use a gold brooch." Whoever acts contrary to these provisions or annuls any of them shall be subject to the penalty of death. So, um, quite a lot of stuff to cover here. Uh, some scholars, uh, you just read 45, right? I just read 45. Yeah. Okay. Uh, some scholars think that the decree ends in verse 45, while others see the provisions for publication in verse uh, 48 as uh, showing that the decree runs through 49. It has even been suggested that verse 41 refers to a different, more restricted group of leaders than all the people of verse 46. Uh, if that is the case, one would then have an approval of Simon by influential leaders distinct from his final approval by the people. Uh, and, of course, on, uh, on 41 through 42... Mm -hmm. The twofold grouping reflects the dual role of Simon as high priest and commander. So he's obviously, you know, from what we just read, he's going to be receiving a lot of powers, uh, as has been offered to, uh, to other people. Um, but the condition until a trustworthy prophet should arise uh, was mentioned earlier in connection with what to do with the polluted stones of the altar in 447. Uh, the author is aware that the events recounted occurred after the prophets ceased to appear and so may reflect less an opposition to Simon than a hope for further restoration. The role of the trustworthy prophet has been variously interpreted. Uh, one, the prophet is to, be re is to replace Simon. Two, the prophet is to decide whether Simon is fit to be ruler. 
uh, three, only a prophet, not an assembly of people and priests, has the right to appoint a ruler as the trustworthy prophet Samuel uh, had anointed Saul and David. Most scholars seem to agree that the prophet will decide whether Simon is fit to be ruler, but the recognition by the priests and the people of their own limitations may be more likely. Uh, and then later on, actually liable to punishment, uh, of course, your uh, the translation you had says punishment of death. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, that he just uh, notes that that means the death penalty because uh, apparently the the text didn't originally have that, but that is what it means. Yeah. So I guess uh, it's just in there. Use of the same Greek expression at Leviticus 20, verse 9, 11, 12, 13, 16, and 27. Yep. Those are the exact verses he quotes. <laughs> yep. Um, so about this letter, there's just a bit here. Uh, he says that Josephus omits the document. Uh, Our document has many parallels in Greek honorific inscriptions and surely imitates them in many respects. Nevertheless, the original was written in Hebrew and drew very much on Hebrew and Aramaic patterns. We have very few examples to tell us how the Semitic people drew up communal resolutions. Of the parallel, only Nehemiah 9 through 10 is probably free from Greek influence. Also important for our purposes are the Greek documents of Hellenized Idumean refugees living in Egypt, OGIS 737 of 112 BCE. Um, so, I mean, a little bit more about the uh, originality of the document. Yeah. Uh, First Maccabees thus appears to be partly quoting, partly uh, reporting the decree, uh, And there are some indications that the author has developed the original text in the light of his own historical narrative. Uh, Verses uh, 27 through 28, apart from the final phrase, are probably a direct quotation, as are verses 29 through 34, though the reference in verse 30 to Jonathan seems strange in a decree honoring Simon, and the author, who consistently shows Simon and Jonathan acting in tandem, may have imported it. Uh, Verse 35, which speaks of the action of the people rather than of Simon, uh, interprets the sequence of verses 34 and 36, which clearly belong together, and verses 38 through 40 uh, record the action of Demetrius in confirming Simon's high priesthood. But the Jews would hardly wish to proclaim publicly the dependence of the office on a foreign king. Verse 40 also betrays the author's interests. He wished to indicate reference to Simon's good standing with Rome and achieves it by reporting it as part of Demetrius's motivation. There's apparently a lot of translation problems in this section, too. (laughs) Sounds about right. Uh, This obvious insertion from the author has somehow affected the continuity of the text, for in the Greek, verse 41 appears as a continuation of what Demetrius had heard. So the original document, therefore, contained a date, a general introduction, a description of the political background, uh, which uh, refers to the earlier parts of the Maccabean struggle, but does not mention Judas, and an account of Simon's achievements. Yeah, apparently there's a few documents that are similar in their structure. Yeah, yeah, they note that uh, here too. Um, He names them, but they're like... He does this thing with his references where he just lists them all... Yeah, yeah. And uh, it makes it really difficult when they list, like, a few words and then a whole bunch of references and then a few words and a whole bunch of references that are part of the same sentence. Yeah, yeah. I know what what you're talking about. Yeah, it's a pain to read. But surely all of these things are, you know, to some degree commonplace. Yeah. Yeah. Including the death penalty, I guess. 
The entire people resolved to grant Simon the right to act according to these provisions. Simon accepted and agreed to serve as high priest and to be commander and prince of the nations, the Jews, and the priests to preside over all. Why wouldn't he? <laughs> like, hey, you want absolute power over this entire nation? Sounds like a lot of work. No one can ever disagree with you or they die. Yeah. Oh, but I also, guess. remember, the <laughs> Seleucids, they're liars. They always lie. They're always trying to... Fool the Jews. Mm. That's kind of the whole point of the book. <laughs> yeah. They ordered that this text be drawn up on bronze tablets and set up in the precinct of the sanctuary in a conspicuous place, and that copies of the tablets be placed in the treasury so as to be available. The temple treasury. Yes. For Simon and his son. So uh, specifically, Simon and his son. Yeah, it says, uh, however, Simon is not given the absolute power of a monarch, nor the promise of dynastic secession. Uh, there it's remains a one-time thing. There remains the possibility that a prophet might come and order otherwise. So it's not exactly absolute. Mm. Um, God hasn't been brought I up for a good while. If well, yeah. In here. So. Yeah, at the end of parallel documents stand similar provisions for permanent copies of the documents to be placed in public view and for a copy to, to be delivered to the beneficiary. Um, the treasury here is probably the temple treasury. So I'm just wondering, because this commentary at least doesn't mention it, but uh, what... What's up with these bronze or brass? Or oh, that was just, uh, you know, you need to inscribe these things and have them publicly showing. Right. So they're bronze tablets, which yeah. means they um, exist. They, Yeah. They, I mean, they, I don't know if they do now. Right. So, uh, I mean, I'm wondering. At some point, they, they may what, have existed. What would they do with these? Like. Would they? Re it, it, you it's know how obviously we, like a, a memorial. They would plaque. have record yeah. houses yeah. Right. that would hold on to these things after they were done being displayed, and that's actually how we find these things: is the fact that those record houses, some of them, still survived and had, uh, if not full pieces of these uh, metal cuts, then some fragments. Sure. Yeah, it was just publicly presented so everyone can. See it and yeah. check it in memorial. It, it'll get put stuff. away later, but they're not getting rid of it is the point of making it out of the metal. Mm -hmm. And that is the end of this section and this chapter. All right. So uh, one last note here. Uh, some scholars have also worried as to why Simon waited until his third year before having such a decree drawn up. The author of 1 Maccabees, however, places the decree after the removal of Demetrius II from power and suggests uh, by this arrangement that it was only then that Simon could be so publicly proclaimed his, that, that he could so publicly proclaim his quasi-independent position of ethnarch. Mm -hmm. But that is, uh, yeah, that's the end of the chapter here. Here you go. Here's, here's that. Here's that was the longest chapter in First Maccabees, folks. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It was forty-nine verses, and with A through what or forty-nine? Yeah. Uh, A through K. Yeah. So even longer than that. Or not K. J. J. I thought it was. Did you say it was G? No. Well, I guess it doesn't really J. matter because it's like broken up into <laughs> a whole bunch of it's pieces. It's like multiple paragraphs. All right, so how about we hop into chapter 15, shall we? Chapter 15, well, why don't you do that while I uh, be right back. Oh, my God. I got to do this all on my own. Here I am carrying the show on my back. My back already hurts, guys. Come on. All right, I'm just going to continue here. Antiochus son of King Demetrius, sent a letter from the islands of the sea to Simon, high priest and prince of the nation of the Jews, and to the entire nation. Its content was as follows. King Antiochus to Simon, high priest and prince of the nation, and to the nation of the Jews. Greeting. 
whereas, and I know there's some commentary on whereas, but Ruben is not here for that, I guess. Uh, certain traitors have seized power over the kingdom of our ancestors, and I am determined to assert my claim to the kingdom in order to restore it to its former state. I have raised a large force of mercenary soldiers and have had warships fitted out. I intend to land in our territory in order to punish those who have ruined our domains and laid waste many cities in my kingdom. Therefore, I now confirm for you all the exemptions conceded to you by the kings who preceded me and all other awards which they conceded to you. So, lot, lots of good stuff might happen. I suppose I keep I kept zooming out there. I was like, "Oh, he's changing back from reading to commentary." There is no point in doing that. Yeah, Ruben is in the back. No point. Uh, I grant you permission to strike your own coinage as currency for your country. So one of the things about the coinage, uh, we don't have any of those. We don't have any evidence of that. <laughs> it would be cool if we did, but apparently, Just because someone has permission. I know, I know, but we don't have any of the coins as well. If he did make them, we don't have them. Mm -hmm. uh, anyways, you're back. Do you have any commentary on these first six verses? Yeah, I do have a bit You do? To say. Okay. Uh, Antiochus surnamed Sidides because he had been raised inside in Pamphylia. Uh, so apparently they used Antiochus and... They used the surname Sidetes at, at the point. Uh, I think it would just be pronounced Sidetes, and it's uh, from where he's from. Also, there's a term scoundrels in verse 3, which literally means plague, but is applied in Greek literature to subversive persons. Like, oh, like kind of like how we use cancer. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, like Chris is a cancer. I didn't do anything yet. <laughs> yeah, and you're a Sagittarius. <laughs> hey. I'm not, but okay. Um, It doesn't fucking matter. Why the fuck would I know your Zodiac sign? I don't know. I don't know your Zodiac sign. I have the same Zodiac sign as Chris. Okay, yeah, I know yeah, that. Well, duh. Which isn't cancer. Yeah, okay. no. We're on fire. We're Scorpios. No. Um. So, yeah, no coins. We don't know whether he actually exercised this privilege. Yeah, no idea. Jerusalem and the temple are to be free. All the armaments which you have fabricated and the fortifications which you have built and now hold shall remain in your hands. From now on and for all time, you are released from any debt to the royal treasury and from any future royal dues. So this happens a lot in First Maccabees, doesn't it? Oh, yeah, all the time. Yeah. Um, and the kind of concessions that are given between kingdoms is actually absurd. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. Like, I doubt any, like, actual kingdom would be fine with, like, you have complete control pretty much. Yeah. Like, at that point, they're not benefiting them in any way. They're really not. Like, these, you know, world superpowers, they're assholes. Now, presumably, it allows them to engage in trade. Sure. But they were going to do that anyway. <laughs> Pre I mean, unless they were going to war with them. Right. Uh, when we shall have... Sorry, wait. When we shall have established our rule over the kingdom... Uh, over our kingdom. We shall confer great honor upon you and your nation and your temple so that the whole land will know of your distinction. Uh, in the year 174, which is the year uh, 139 or, one, or 138 BCE. Okay. Uh, in the year 174, Antiochus came ashore into the land of his ancestors. All the troops rallied to him so that only a few were left with Tryphon. 
Antiochus pursued Tryphon, who fled to Dora by the sea. For he knew that his position was desperate since the troops had deserted him. Antiochus laid siege to Dora with a force of 120,000 warriors and 8,000 cavalrymen. He surrounded the town while his ships joined the siege on the seaside. He pressured the town hard by land and by sea and allowed no one to leave or enter. What verse is that? Uh, that was 14. Okay. So, tell me when you get to 25. Okay. Uh, there is a, a note here, actually, on um, verses 15 through 24, and maybe this is why. Um, it just says that they're equivalent to verses 14. Uh, it's, it's all verse... Uh, 24. That's why verse 24 was cut up. Mm. Because in this section, they're apparently the same thing. Uh, on the displacement of verses 15 through 24, see uh, introductory note <coughs> uh, 2, 14, 16 through 24K. Uh, on the manuscript readings of verse 25, see note. Uh, okay, so see a different note. So yeah, uh, Obviously, I don't think we're going to have time to cover all that. Right. Because uh, there's a lot. Well, they say in here, the statement of 1525, which we'll get to, mm -hmm. that Antiochus besieged Dor for the second time is strange, as there has been no suggestion that the first attempt had ended, and the phrase may have entered the text as a marginal note indicating resumption of the story after the author's typical intrusion of a different subject in 15 through 24. Yeah, so it seems... Uh, I mean, we're going to get to that in a second. I'll just finish off the, the section. Uh, dot, dot, dot. As he brought his forces up against the town continually and structured siege works. Um, so yeah, verse that was immediately to verse 25 because the other ones are evidently the same mm. as verse 24. Um, and I wonder... If uh, he actually has uh, some different notes on on that in here, uh, yeah, it's hard to find, isn't it? It really is, because uh, I don't think we can go over each singular one because there are simply too many. Uh, it would have to be for something else. So this is my yeah. complaint about the Anchor Bible series, um, at least their Maccabees, right? They have these introductory notes, but they don't place them at the beginning of the chapter. And it's not always clear what they're talking about until after you've read the chapter. Sure. I mean, right. that's kind of how commentaries work a lot right. of the time. Right. But if you're going to do an introductory note, you should do like, this is a vague overview of what we're doing. Uh here, there's some difficulties between these verses and so on and so on, which we will go into more depth in the commentary proper. Um, and also, I don't like putting the notes at the ends of the chapters. I, I like footnotes. I don't like end notes. I think that a lot... I mean, I get why, because... It, if because yeah, they're quite long. Yeah. In my very brief time with any research in this field, I've concluded that they don't have good indexers and they aren't necessarily information structurally oriented. They're they, more about just getting out their thoughts at the point that they think is relevant. I don't think they have a formal structure. Uh, so Chris has covered the, he has just barely scraped the top of Wanna. one of one subject, one narrow subject, and he has concluded that people in the whole field don't care about structure I and have don't have paid a attention structure, to most and they're of bad the, indexers. I have <laughs> paid attention to most episodes and of your excerpts. I would conclude that as well. It's not your <laughs> fault that they didn't do it that well, and I'm not even blaming them because that's common play outside of any scientific or engineering field. They don't have the same rigor and structure to their, their, their writings, of course. 
any commentary on it as well is is probably lacking that. It's okay, Chris. Just read more. It'll all be all right. I think that these notes would be a lot shorter if, in addition to just using the note as a footnote, they also included endnotes for each of the footnotes for the sources. (laughs) You know? Because, like, the sources fill up so much space in this note. In the notes. Yeah, they really do. Right. So I think that would be a better way of doing it. That's my only complaints about it is that it's kind of a jumbled mess. But the it, it is jumbled, good. yeah. Uh, Simon sent a force of 2,000 picked men to assist him, along with silver and gold coin and considerable equipment. The king, however, refused to accept them and repudiated all his previous agreements with Simon treating him with hostility. Indeed, the king sent Athenobius, one of his friends, to hold discussions. And of course, friends of the king, is like, that's yeah. an actual title. It's a position. Yeah. It's you a brooch or two and maybe a purple uh, gra- uh, garment, right? Yeah. The ability yeah. to wear them. Uh, Athenobius brought the following message. You are holding Jop and Gazara and the Acre in Jerusalem, cities of my kingdom. You have laid waste their territories and caused grave damage in our domains, and you have seized many districts of my kingdom. Accordingly, deliver over to me the cities you have captured and the taxes of the districts outside the borders of Judea over which you have seized control. So what uh, verse is that? Uh, that was verse 30. Okay. So this uh, guy who's the king's friend, mm-hmm. Athenobius, is unknown outside of 1st Maccabees. Completely, Completely unknown person. Completely unknown. Completely unknown. Uh, there's also some detail here um, about, uh, in addition to the three cities mentioned, Simon also held Akron, Adida, and four other districts. Whereas earlier, the author of 1st Maccabees states that the Citadel, Seleucid forces, and Jewish renegades did great damage in Jerusalem and Israel, he now reports that Antiochus claims that Simon has done so to Seleucid territory. Simon thus is classified with those forces against whom Antiochus the Seventh intended to fight. Uh, And anyways, the message is uh, continuing here. Or else pay 500 talents of silver as compensation for the territory and 500 more talents for the damage you have done and for the taxes due from the cities. Otherwise, we shall come and make war on you. So it seems like, you know, they were giving a lot of power over to, uh, to Simon. Um, but at the same time, it seems like they took too much, like in the past. Mm -hmm. So the Seleucids wanted some of it back, basically. Uh, when Athenobius, the king's friend, came to Jerusalem and saw Simon's splendor, the gold and silver drinking vessels on his sideboard and his numerous retinue, he was astonished, similar to how... Uh, the queen of Sheba was astonished by, by uh, <laughs> Solomon's yeah. riches and wealth. When he had delivered to him the king's message, Simon replied, We have not taken land that is not ours, nor have we conquered anything that belongs to others. Rather, we have taken our ancestral heritage, which had been unjustly conquered by our enemies using one opportunity or another. Oh my God, this is great. Um, <laughs> this uh, and These ancestral land claims, mm. I love these, especially since, you know, if we're talking about the Bible, if we're talking about Israel, oh. they, they took it from somebody. Yeah. They took it from the people who were living there. Like, yeah, they murdered if, them. If you if they you assume killed all of the men and they took the women and children. Yeah, if you assume that the narrative is true, then you're just a hypocrite. And if you also believe that, you know, it's it just should always continually 
be Israel's because of ancestral claims. Like I, I, assume, I think people should. You I know. assume that there's certain aspects of the invading land, killing all of the men and taking the women and children as slaves uh, narrative that the Bible pushes that is accurate historically to what the uh, people did. Uh, well, if we're talking about uh, how the original Israelites got to Israel, it, they were semi-nomadic. So it wasn't like murder. So they didn't murder any town. There wasn't a single town where they killed all the men and okay. enslaved if, all if the women. Okay, if we're talking and about later wars, sure. But yeah. while they were semi nomadic and just like moving in, no. Oh. At least not in like war times. Maybe like some some asshole did that, but not in like times of war. They do it continuously throughout the Bible. I know, I know. So if you assume the narrative is true, then that's a different conversation we right. have. Either way, where was I? Right. Which obviously the Bible land. is historically mm. accurate. Of course. Of course. Only the King James Version. Only that one. All right. Anyways... Now we, seizing our opportunity, lay claim to our ancestral heritage. As for Jop and Gazara, which you demand, those cities were causing grave damage to our people and our country. In payment for them, we are ready to give a hundred talents. Athenobius gave him no reply, but angrily returned to the king and reported this conversation to him, telling him also of Simon's splendor and of all that he had seen. The king was furious. Ooh, he's mad. Yeah, and that is, uh, I don't know if that's the end of the chapter. Uh, let's check. That's not the end of the chapter. Oh, wow. The next part of this commentary? Yeah, it goes, splits it up because it goes over two of them. Yeah, it, it goes like 10 verses into the next chapter. Yeah. But you're almost at the end of the chapter. You have like only yeah. a few more verses left. Yeah, I can finish the chapter. Yeah. When Trifon embarked on board a ship and escaped to Orthosia, the king appointed Kenabias commander-in-chief of the coastal region and gave him forces of infantry and cavalry with orders to establish bases against Judea. In particular, he ordered him to fortify Kedron and Shadaim and to wage war on our people. Uh, and it's interesting how it went from uh, third person to now first person because the author is saying our people. Right. Meanwhile, the king undertook the pursuit of Trifon. Uh, Kendabias came to Jemnia and began to harass our people by invading Judea and kidnapping and murdering our people. On fortifying Kedron, he stationed their cavalrymen and troopers to make sallies as highwaymen on the roads of Judea in accordance with the king's commands. So I think there's uh, a little bit of stuff we can probably talk about. There should be something. Uh, was that the end? That was the end, okay. yeah. So, um, well, Antiochus the seventh goes north in pursuit of Trypho. He arranges to gain control of the southern coast. He, like Demetrius I, Demetrius II, and Trypho, knows that the power of the Jews must be curtailed. Sendibus is given to the office that Simon had held. Uh, Sendibus was to fortify Kedron. Yeah, and that was uh, Kendabias. Yeah. yeah. So I think there should be a decent amount of commentary on Sendibus? Sendibius? Sendibius? Sendibius, okay. I guess. I'm going to call it Sendibius. Okay. Uh, That's good. About four miles southeast of Jamnia and about eight or nine more miles southwest of Gazara. It has also been identified by some scholars with Nisan, just over two miles southeast Nisan. of N I H S O N. I guess. Sorry. Oh, that's different. Never mind. Yes. Just over two miles southeast of Gezer. But such a base would be close to the mountains and almost 12 miles from Jamnia. With this fortified base, Sendibus, 
Pats and WS could ah. sally out to attack the Western routes to Jerusalem. So here's actually something interesting. There might be something to comment on. Uh, where I have and Shadaim in verse 39, the Greek text literally has and to strengthen the gates. Hebrew idiom would require its gates if the gates were those of Kedron. Alert scribes seem to have been puzzled. Uh, there's a manuscript uh, or a series of manuscripts that have uh, polis, towns, uh, for Pilus, but uh, they are unlikely to be correct since one would then expect the towns to be named. The translator has probably taken the proper noun, Shadaim, and misheard it as Seraim, or, yeah, Seraim, gates. The two words are spelled identically in vowelless Hebrew. Shadaim was near Kedron, along with uh, the... Yeah, along the brook Sorek. So, yeah, that's neat. Yeah. Now, hand me that copy of 1st Maccabees. And let's finish There's this a copy book. of 1st Maccabees. I don't Maccabees. need that anymore. That, that's true, you book. don't. <laughs> After this chapter. Yeah, no more bookmark. Yeah. John came up from Gazara and reported to his father Simon the outrages of being perpetrated by Kendabios. Yeah, and we're now finally learning about this son, John. <laughs> yeah. Therefore, Simon summoned his two eldest sons, Judas and John, and said to them, I and my brothers and the older generations of our family have fought the enemies of Israel from my youth down to the present day. So my brothers probably refers to Jonathan, mm -hmm. of course, yeah. And, the, and many times have we succeeded in rescuing Israel. Now, however, I have grown old, whereas you, thanks to his mercy, have reached the age of competence. <laughs> you know what? I'm going to say that to my kids one day. Mm. You have reached the age of competence. I think that's actually a thing in Catholicism. The age of competence? Yeah. It, I have like a weird ceremony, like thing that I got a certificate for at some point when I was seven. And it says you have reached the age of competence? Yeah, it's fucked up. I'm not kidding. That is fucked up. <laughs> it, it's like the yeah. age of reason and competence. Seven years old. I'm like, I think that's a bit young. <laughs> Take my place and the place of my brothers. Go and champion the cause of your nation and may the help of heaven be with you. Simon raised from the land a force of 20,000 picked warriors and cavalrymen, and they marched out against Candebios. They spent the night at Modane. On rising in the morning, they marched out into the plain. There, a large force of infantry and cavalry confronted them. Between the two armies, there was a rushing brook. Simon and his armies halted opposite the enemy. When Simon saw that the people were afraid to cross the brook, he plunged across first. When the men saw him, they plunged across after him. He distributed his army, assigning cavalry to each infantry unit, for the enemy were very numerous. They sounded the trumpets, and Kendabios was routed with his army. Many of them fell slain, and the survivors fled to their fortresses. Though John's brother Judas was then wounded, John pursued them as far as Kedron, which Kendabios had fortified. The enemy fled to the forts in the open country around Azotus. John set fire to it. Two thousand of the enemy fell. John returned safe to Judea. Uh, the name Kendabios has close parallels in Thrace and Asia Minor. Uh, he needed to have... He need have had no other source than 1st Maccabees... It was legitimate to infer that one who received the high post of commanders in chief of the coastal region was a friend of the king. So, uh, um, 
a uh, note here yeah. quick. Uh, so during the pursuit, uh, Judas... Uh, okay, uh, so the grammar of these verses, 16, uh, 8 through 10, is a little confused. As subjects of verbs are left out, it seems as if the Seleucid forces fled to the fortress, i.e. Kedron, when Syndebius uh, had been ordered to fortify. But during the pursuit, Judas is wounded, and so John pursues alone until Syndebius reaches Kedron. Others keep going until they reach the watchtowers positioned within the limits of Azotus, or Ashdod. In the mosaic map of Judea found at Medeba, Medeba, I don't know, towers are depicted in the open country between Azotus and Jamnia, which uh, I found interesting. But then uh, also a note here, uh, what John burned is unclear. It might have been the city, might have been the towers themselves. We don't know. Uh Since we are near to the end of the ancient scroll where the text could suffer damage, the text may well have been tattered and resembled the, the wrong order. If so, the original probably had John set fire to it, Kedron. The enemy fled from burning Kedron to use forts in the open country around Azotus. Two of the few, 2,000 of the fugitives fell. John returned safe to Judea. Towers in the open country around Azotus are pictured in the ancient mosaic map of the Holy Land found at Medaba and Transjordan. Um, so now we're getting into, I think it's the last section here. Yeah. Almost. Well, it might be the actual 11 last one. through 24. And oh, then yeah, it that's goes the last to one maps. Then. Yep. That's the last one then. Which, by the way, if our viewers haven't uh, been made aware of this yet, there's a whole bunch of maps. Where are they? Oh, there you go. Pull it up. A whole bit. bunch of maps. What? A yeah. whole bunch of maps that uh, if you were following along at home, these maps probably would make navigating the story a lot easier. A lot easier, easier yeah. Yeah. As you can tell, like, where stuff is. <laughs> <laughs> On a map. And it even tells you where they went, which is really useful. Um, also, yeah, that uh, the cover is falling apart. <laughs> yeah, this cover is literally falling apart. There's just pieces of it falling like off. Just <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, who cares? It's cover. Yeah. It doesn't affect the text. Yeah. Anyways, Ptolemy, the son of Abubos received the post of commander over the plain of Jericho. And he had much gold and silver, for he was the son-in-law of the high priest. Intoxicated with his success, he formed the desire to seize control over the country and treacherously plotted to do away with Simon and his sons. So uh, just a note here for context. Uh, after an interval of three years in the winter of 134 BCE, Simon's son-in-law, Ptolemy, son of Ababus, attempted a coup. He knew that Antiochus VII was opposed to Simon, and perhaps that Antiochus was preparing to invade Judea, which he did a few months later, when he ultimately captured uh, Jerusalem. This victory of Antiochus VII is not mentioned in 1 Maccabees, a loose end left untied. Mm. All right. Simon was conducting a tour of inspection in... Simon was conducting a tour of inspection of the towns of his country and looking to their needs when he came down to Jericho with his sons, Mattathias and Judas, in the year 177, in the 11th month, which is the month of Shabbat. So 134 BCE, January, February. Mm. Okay. The son of Abubos treacherously received them in the castle called Dok, which he had built. There, uh, Dok was a small fortress near Jericho that some scholars have identified with the top of the Mount of Temptation. The 
Mount of Temptation. Yeah, I don't know. It might be the... I don't know if that's like an actual mountain or if that is uh, the one where like Jesus is being tempted. Okay. Metaphorically. Um, our author takes care to say that the castle was built by Ptolemy, perhaps to refute the sectarian teaching that Simon the cursed man and his sons fulfilled the prophecy at Joshua 626. The castle dock has been plausibly located at the summit of Mount of Temptations. The mountain has been called Jebel el Duk by Arabs and Byzantine lives of saints. Makes sense. Speak of a monastery called Doka on the mountainside, and a spring near the mountain is still called Ain Duk. Josephus says that Ptolemy fled from the vengeance of John to Dagon, one of the defensive works overlooking Jericho. Nothing compels us to identify Dagon with Doc. It is possible, however, that the site originally bore the pagan name Dagon and or Dagon, and that Jews were Jews with scrupulous Bulls against the speaking of the name of foreign deities changed the name to the inoffensive Doc. As the root meaning of the word in Hebrew and Greek, Mista Potos, implies a banquet always involved the drinking of liquor. So, so uh, which uh, he had built there, he concealed men while he set a sumptuous banquet before his guests. That's the end of that verse. Tell me when you get to the end of 17. Okay. When Simon and his sons became drunk, Ptolemy and his men emerged from hiding, seized their arms, and rushed into the banquet hall upon Simon and killed him and his two sons and some of their servants. Thus, Ptolemy committed high treason and returned evil for good. That's the end of 17. Uh, it's so, very uh, Game of Thrones. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Ptolemy commits one of the cardinal sins in the Greco-Roman world by breaking the law of hospitality. Once one had eaten or drunk with a guest, one was bound to treat that guest properly. Uh, according to Josephus, uh, which you have already noted, Ptolemy did not immediately kill Simon's sons and wife, but waited until later He, uh, when besieged by John. Uh, we cannot be sure which version is true, although Josephus' account is highly emotional and sensational. This discrepancy alerts us to the fact that ancient historians differed in their accounts of how leaders died. Alexander the Great was variously depicted as killed by poisoning uh, or by a fever. Uh, given this tendency of ancient historians to create a death that they thought was appropriate, it is interesting that the author of 1 Maccabees reports that Simon and his sons get drunk at a great uh, carousal? Well, I guess. I, I don't know, okay. Uh, and then Carousel? Killed. It's not how you spell carousel. Uh, and then are killed. Uh, Josephus more discreetly writes that Simon dies at a banquet, uh, which a discerning reader would know included heavy drinking. Did the author of First Maccabees feel uh, obliged to tell the truth no matter what? He did not feel so obliged in describing the death of Antiochus the Fourth because of disappointment and regret over what Antiochus had done in Judea. How would the author of First Maccabees have come by this knowledge of Simon's death? And of course, the motif of being killed by one's enemies while one is drunk is found elsewhere in the hebrew scripture mm. so yes any notes is. first kings and judith and yeah. yeah he then wrote an account of what he had done and sent a messenger with it to the king asking the king to send him troops to assist him offering to deliver to the king the cities and the taxes that answers how uh we have an account of what happened there he wrote an account and had it <laughs> sent. He sent other men to Gazra to do away with John and to the regimental commanders. He sent letters to come to him, intending to bribe them with silver and gold and with gifts. Others he ran to seize Jerusalem and the Temple Mount. However, 
a man ran up to John at Gazara and informed him that his father and brothers had perished and told him, He has also sent a man to kill you. On hearing the news, John was stunned, but he seized the men who had come to kill him and slew them, for he knew that they sought to do away with them. As for the remainder of the history of John, his wars and his valorous deeds and his wall building and his other accomplishments... Tell me where they're written. All these are recorded in the chronicles of his high priesthood from the time he succeeded his father as high priest. So, you know what's really neat... The fact that this ends on that kind of uh, death. I was going to say. Yeah. It, I, it's very Well, much I was going to say what makes it really neat is that it ends essentially saying, and as for Jonathan. Yeah. And all his deeds. Are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of Jonathan? Jonathan? Of the Maccabees. Of the kings and of... Judea <laughs> of of the heroes of the Maccabean family. Uh yeah. yeah, so it it's very interesting that that's how it ends. Um so here's a, a few notes here on the ending. According to Josephus, John reached Jerusalem ahead of Ptolemy's men and gained control of the city. At that, Ptolemy retreated to Dok, uh where John besieged him. John is said to have abandoned the siege because a sabbatical year was coming on. Ptolemy fled to Zenon, the ruler of Philadelphia, in Transjordan. The same year, or sorry, that same year, Antiochus VII invaded Judea and besieged John in Jerusalem. After a lengthy siege marked by surprisingly indulgent behavior from Antiochus, who allowed a truce so that the Feast of Tabernacles could be celebrated... Very interesting. John and Antiochus VII reached a settlement in Jerusalem. The walls of Jerusalem were demolished and coins of Antiochus were minted. Later, John accompanied Antiochus on his expedition against the Parthians in 130 or 129 BCE. Only Antiochus's death on this campaign could John exert his own power. Only after Antiochus's death. Uh, the independence of Judea depended on Seleucid weakness. None of this, however, is reported by the author of 1 Maccabees. He leaves Jerusalem free and independent. Uh, no mention is made, uh, as had been for Mattathias, Judas, and Jonathan, that all Israel bewailed Simon's death. Uh, and, of course, we already noted this, but rather the author ends with a formula so different from that at uh, Judas's death, but so similar to that found throughout the books of Kings. Yes. Uh, one suspects that the author is hinting that the Hasmoneans have become a ruling family with all that it entails, wealth, a bureaucracy, uh, and family intrigue. The heady days of the opening revolt against the Seleucids have been replaced by Hasmonean institutionalization. So that's... Uh, it's the end of First Maccabees. Yeah, I think I might have one more note so, actually. Well, but that's definitely okay. the end of that commentary on First Maccabees. The author clearly thinks highly of John, but has no intention of writing an account of his life, which is apparently in the past, though his death is not mentioned. It has often been suggested that First Maccabees indirectly supports the Hasmonean rule of John Hyrcanus, who was not popular with everyone, by presenting such a glowing account of his father and uncles. Our author notes John's further achievements recorded in the annals of his high priesthood. Any such annals were probably destroyed in 63, or if not then, uh, 70 CE, when the Romans destroyed the temple. So... Yeah, I think uh, a rule or being written directly after Jonathan. Actually, no, you know, they, an author would have written an actual account of like the end days of Jonathan. Would they not have? Like, because even if you are imitating the author of the King's narrative. I'm, unless it was something that they didn't have uh, information about or you know there's also a lot of stuff where like 
let's say I'm reading uh, history book X, right? Sure. And history book X is about so and so whose name is X, and they mention his kids, and then they talk about his grandkids. But you know, they they don't necessarily say. And then his grandkids had, uh, you know, four children between all of them, right? And yeah. Like so on and so on. They have to stop at some point. Yeah, but the thing is. John took over quite a lot. How many genealogy books have you read other than the Bible? Not not enough. Obviously. Not enough. Okay. Well, they're thus they're just that. Yeah, but the, there the you go. well, that's what genealogy is. Yeah. yeah but my that, dad wonders why I'm not interested when he tells me all about it. That's that's kind of you know at issue though, uh, because when <laughs> when talking about you know when talking so highly of John, and then you know what we just read out from the NIB commentary was that he was pretty successful towards the end of his reign. So why would you not mention that? Like, I feel like that would be better propaganda wise. So I, I think at, at actually at the end of Hyrcanus's oh. reign is actually a good dating. And I think when we initially started reading the, the book and the commentaries, that was pretty much the consensus. Uh, it I, depends on what kind of uh, propaganda that you want to push, right? Because also, you can end the story shut up, Chris. multiple Why? points if uh, you want to push different points of propaganda. Like, if I wanted to push a... Like, I could end the story where Judah Mac, uh, Judas dies, right? Okay. And just ignore everything that happens after that. Because, to be honest, a lot of what happens after that is... And then so-and-so became the leader and the high priest, and he was recognized by all those people. Then he died in some battle, and then so-and-so became the leader and high priest and was recognized, and then he died, and then so-and-so became the leader and high priest and was recognized, and they sent letters back and forth about it, right? Um, so you can cut it off after... Uh, Judas dies, uh, and you can serve a totally different point of propaganda, which I think is what they do with the Hanukkah story. Right? Yeah, and uh, later we're gonna actually that you know the the traditional mm. traditional Hanukkah story is in Second Maccabees, I think, mm. because the one that we covered in this one it was just like a temple rededication. Right. So, like, I mean. If they had just included the story of uh, Judas and his military victories and his little miracle that sure, he did sure. and so on and so on, they could still accomplish mm, yeah. various points of propaganda. So Yeah, that's that a good point because if you're, if you're making a whole book about just the revolt and like a slow taking back, by the time John has this area, you wouldn't really need to include it, I guess. I and think you're that trying this to is not that much of propaganda. It's at least, if it is propaganda, of stuff we've read thus far on any of our live streams, this is Maccabees in general has been some of the least, perhaps, propaganda. I know it has an intent, but I also think that it's one of the least biased uh, intents. Well, I mean... It tries to be more accurate is all I'm saying. You know, what I'm... When I'm talking about, you know, propaganda and pushing a narrative, like I'm not talking about it in like, you know, the kind of Nazi kind of propaganda. No, no, I know there are many kinds of propaganda. I'm not disagreeing that it is or is not propaganda. It's definitely propaganda. I'm saying that its intent is the least directed. I mean, it's... It's the least honed. I mean, it does... I think it does have a very honed intent, but well, uh, it's not as like malicious or capricious as other propagandas okay but like, maybe it definitely has a whole intent i'm still trying to phrase this correctly but what it does does not say as nearly drastic an impact as other things like yes yeah, it's you the, know the I propaganda agree, in drastic. the bible could be you're an atheist you're gonna eat your kids you know that's that's something that is extreme but maccabees has it, it the mildest propaganda i've seen so far in, in that regard right when i'm talking about propaganda that includes stuff like just justification for rulers and, yeah, and reigns in general so it's it's well yeah and that's, that's what i was term. gonna say is that uh, if anything ending it the way that they do mm -hmm. um it 
might be an author's uh, attempt to just legitimize uh, this specific lineage yeah. in one specific person, right? Yeah. So uh, you say you've got John here at the end, mm-hmm. right? And so we want to make John look legitimate. Well, how are we going to do that? We're going to talk about how all of his uh, his father and his uncles mm, and yeah. his grandfather, how incredible they were and yeah. how they... Uh, you know, saved the people. So, I mean, it could be that. It, that could be why they chose to end it there. And I think it would be interesting to, like, w- once we read through Second Maccabees, it would be interesting to see the contrast in the viewpoints. Mm-hmm. And perhaps, perhaps the theologies, maybe. We don't really get too much information about that. But there's definitely some underlying ones, like the prophet thing, for example. Yeah, there were... Uh, th- there's only a couple of theological points that happen in First Maccabees. Yeah, exactly. So maybe we will get more of that uh, in Second Maccabees. And even if we don't, uh, it would be interesting to contrast purposes for, for authorship. Yeah. But either way, uh, that is the end for the show today. And that is the end of First Maccabees. If you enjoyed our stream today... B- Dro- drop a yeah. like, like, subscribe, subscribe, share it around with Patreon. Patreon, yes, Let absolutely. Let people know Teespring. we're doing more of this. You know, this is not a standalone, and it never has been. Please continue. Yeah, that's why we have like multiple numbers. In yeah, the ti- uh, you know, we do another show on Sunday. Yeah, if, if you're Sunday not school. watching us, then same time, same channel. <laughs> yeah, same time, same channel. Uh, so yeah, Patreon, you get a lot of cool rewards. So if you are able to, I know you know times are really tough right now. So I understand uh, that even if you want to, you can't right now, especially because yeah, it's just hard right now. Yeah, because a lot of people have lost their jobs. Unemployment is wow. <laughs> if you if you see the graph, it'll it'll hurt your neck. You have to look up so high. Uh, on that chart, it is ridiculous. It, it's pretty bad. Yeah. So, but hey, if you want to uh, send in some money, by the way, did you count when we got oh, our donation earlier? Yes, yes, because I did. we're still going towards that alchemy drive. Yes, with our doma- donations. We are fourteen dollars uh, and eleven cents away from doing alchemy. Uh, so, in fourteen dollars and eleven cents. We will be transmuting material. Yeah, we will. Yeah. We'll, we'll try it. Uh, so, yeah, uh, Patreon Teespring. Get yourself a shirt. You know, you're, yeah. you're at home. You got nothing nothing to do. You're running out of food. Get yourself a shirt so you can stay nice and cozy and look good. You could also, <laughs> if you want to be really nice, go on to Amazon. Check out our Amazon wish list. And get us a book that we can use on one of our shows. So that, yeah, make uh, yeah. make these shows even longer yeah. by contributing something to our ever. <laughs> uh, ever growing list of commentaries. Yep, make Milwaukee atheists great, great again. again. Yeah, uh, great. I <laughs> well, I mean, you know, you could because uh, that was Reagan's thing. Right. Make Milwaukee atheists great again. Yeah, I don't that was think Reagan's, that was Reagan's thing. Reagan's no, no, made no. him. Reagan's thing was make America great, right? Okay. Trump's is make America great again. So we can say make Milwaukee atheists great. Ah, uh, okay. Right. And okay, make Milwaukee atheists great. No. Um, Thanks. Uh, we just won some boomers, which <laughs> I, I guess is most of our audience yeah. anyway. Well, no, not boomers exactly, but getting there. Um. Let's okay, see, what? some Gen Xers and yeah. some boomers. Yeah, mostly Gen Xers. Uh, Maybe a couple silent generation folks. I don't think so. They're like, oh, the last of them. my cribbage club. Does that your <laughs> is Bible study? Woo. Yeah. yeah, that's you. <laughs> <laughs> that one viewer. They just left. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, um, I think that's enough. Yeah, Facebook, Twitter, it's free to follow us on those. Those All links are in the description down below. And until we get a new graphic, I mean, it works for now, but we still need a new graphic. We will 
See you Sunday.